Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you could take your seats, grab your snacks. Uh, my name is Steve Allison. I'm the director of the Newkirk Center for Science and Society. I'm very pleased to be here with you today to introduce the next in our series of faculty fellows presentations. Uh, this series is supported, like all of our Newkirk Center activities, by the generous donations of the Newkirk family, Martha and James. So we appreciate their support over the years. And this program, uh, the Faculty Fellows Program, has been going on for uh, over six months now. And we've had several of our fellows give presentations. In fact, one just last week. Um, maybe some of you got to catch that. And we have, I think, four more uh, coming up this fall season. Um, and we'll soon be having another call for new Faculty Fellows to uh, start in 2024. So this is an opportunity to showcase some of the really excellent and diverse uh, work and research that's going on at UCI amongst our faculty. I think we have something like 1700 faculty and they're all doing amazing work. And so this is our opportunity to bring them together uh, to share some of that work uh, with the broader community. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, I just wanted to also thank uh, Jamie Rich for setting up the logistics here in the Beckman Center, uh, the food and the, the venue. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, who is Yanning Shen, and she is Professor in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, also with a joint appointment in the Department of Computer Science, which is a different department. Um, she earned her bachelor's degree and master's in electrical engineering from the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Then she went on to do her PhD in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Minnesota. And then I believe uh, she came straight here after that. And uh, in the meantime, has won uh, several different awards and uh, prestigious grants, uh, including the 35 under 35 Asia Pacific um, designation by the MIT Technology Review. Uh, she is also a Hellman Fellow, a Google Research Scholar Award winner, and also has a Microsoft Academic Grant Award for AI Research. <clears throat> and she has a a new NSF grant uh, and some nice funding from the National Science Foundation. She's been a mentor for students, including um, HBCU students, uh, women in machine learning, and she's also mentored multiple UCI PhD students. Her research integrates machine learning, data science, statistical signal processing, and uh, many other uh, computational uh, subjects. And these topics have applications in social sciences, neurobiology, environmental problems, uh, finance, the Internet of Things, and, and many other uh, realms as well. And today she's going to be talking to us about understanding and mitigating unfairness in machine learning over networks. So fascinated to hear that. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for the nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Today, it's my great honor to talk to you about my research on understanding and mitigating unfairness in machine learning over networks. Before I get started, I want to give the credit to where credit is due. I want to thank my students and collaborators uh, for their amazing works uh, and that will be presented in this uh, talk. So, before I get started, let's first see the title, look at the title. There are several keywords. So today in this talk, I will talk about how to understand and then mitigate the unfairness in machine learning over networks. So we will look at what is unfairness in machine learning and what is unfairness in machine learning over networks and how can we mitigate that? So. All right, so first of all, networks. Networks are everywhere, uh, including social networks, financial networks, knowledge graphs, e-commerce e networks. In fact, the reason that we are today is because we are all connected through the New Kirk Center. And the New Kirk Center for Science and the Society, we know that all the science topics are connected. 
And the society is there because it's built upon all kinds of connections and networks among individuals. So that motivates us to look at learning over networks. Somehow it doesn't work. So I need to stand here. All right. And today in this talk, I will interchangeably using the terminology graphs for, and the networks, because graphs are mathematical definitions that characterize different networks. So it's mathematical structures to model pairwise relationships. Okay? For, and it consists different components, such as nodes. For example, nodes in a flight network can denote airports or neurons in, in brain networks. While edges can denote the flight path between airports or neural connections in brains. In addition, there are nodal features, which can denote certain kind of features or uh, characteristics of nodes or edges, such as whether in airports or types of neurons. And for us who are, uh, for those of us, us who use the social networks, so each of us is a node in the social network. While the edges are the friendship connections that we form. And the features, nodal features, can denote, for example, our profile picture and all the information that we input on our, in our social network profile. Okay? So, and uh, Specifically, today we will look at the graph machine learning algorithms. What are graph machine learning algorithms? So uh, for here uh, among the audience, I just want you to know who are familiar with uh, machine learning, who have a background in it. Okay, great. So we all know machine learning, okay? Uh, most of us, or at least heard about this word with uh, word with nowadays with the development of large language model and everything. Everything is built upon machine learning, okay? In other, in plain words, it is to write some computer programs so that computers or machines can learn for us. All right, so now what is graph machine learning or machine learning over graphs or networks? It is trying to extract information encoded in the graph data. Okay. And henceforth, it facilitates uh, our understanding on information over network graphs, and it will gain, help us to gain benefits on various predictive tasks. Specifically, given certain type of networks, such as social networks, uh, uh, e-commerce networks, we can extract this mathematical model and use the graph machine learning algorithms, try to help us to understand or answer certain questions about uh, who are potential friends. Like we all get a friend recommendation in Facebook or Instagram, and what items will this customer buy? For example, when you open Amazon, Amazon says, we think you might like, okay? You open Netflix and they, they will also give you recommendations. And what loan applicants is in the lowest risk of debt default? So these are all what graph machine learning algorithms can help us to do. And another keyword in the title is unfairness. So what is unfairness? Before we go on to unfairness in machine learning over graphs, let's first understand what is unfairness in machine learning. Okay? So it has been shown actually machine learning algorithms, while it is very effective in various applications, but it also leads to unfair or biased results, which shows different error rates, for example, on female and the male face recognition, and the different crime prediction accuracy based on ethnicity, as well as different credit approval rates based on gender. Okay? And 
Nowadays, machine learning are widely used in various applications and policy making. So if th that means that if machine learning algorithm entails such kind of unfairness of bias, then it will greatly affect the decision making and the policy making. So henceforth, it's a critical problem. And there are many works have focused on uh, bias or unfairness reduction in machine learning, but on non-graph data. Well, well, fairness over graphs are relatively underexplored. So you may be asking, since the fairness in machine learning has been studied, what's so special about the graph or network data? Okay. So the answer is because when we talk about general machine learning tasks, for example, face recognition, what we are coped with is called tabular data, meaning that there's no structural information. There are just images or text but there's no connectivity patterns, okay? Well, connectivity pattern is a different type of, is, is a, in other words, it encodes the spatial in, information or relational information among individuals that cannot be directly coped with machine learning algorithms that cope with regular tabular data. Well, it has been shown that there are unfairness in different in networks as well. For example, in social networks, it has been shown that the users who get, uh, get recommended to be connected exhibit divergence between males and the females. In addition, users' religion can also be a source of a hiring discrimination in social networks. And now, so these are all conclusions based on prior study. And uh, however, at this point, I, ha I haven't rigorously defined what is unfairness in machine learning, okay? Even though we have a conceptual idea now, but in order for machine or computer to actually solve the problem for us, you know that we have to all formally define the problem, then input it in the computer, and then computer can solve the problem, right? So now, the question is, how to actually define fairness or unfairness? Well, this is a difficult question because fairness can be defined in many different ways, and the different real-world applications actually show biases from various perspectives. So that means that there's a no unique answer. So there's a, not a universal criterion for fairness. What we can do is to use various existing fairness notions based on people's awareness. I will talk about some of the example uh, definitions later. And specifically, when we look at fairness in machine learning, what we are going to do is to, given this graph data or network data that are connected, we use, based on the graph-based application scenario, we may use different fairness notions on graphs. And then what we want to see is how to realize or how to, how to ensure fairness in graph machine learning. And in this talk, I will specifically focus, uh, talk about fairness notions, as well as some arguments that we have been working on in how to uh, develop fairness aware graph machine learning arguments. So the first definition is the demographic parity, also known as statistical parity. Uh, these two are interchangeable, so later you will hear both terms. Uh, demographic parity is first proposed for binary classification tasks for tabular data, okay? So basically, it's, it was first introduced for tabular data without a graph or network. And how it is defined is it is considered as achieved if the model yields the same positive rate for individuals in both sensitive subgroups. 
what it means is, so here are some words that I haven't defined. So what, what it means is, uh, what is sensitive uh, subgroup? Sen sensitive, uh, sorry, sensitive subgroups refer to groups of individuals that we want to ensure the fairness. For example, female versus male, female and male can be viewed as two sensitive groups, okay? And uh, demographic parity basically said is mostly used in a uh, qualification type of tasks. For example, college admission, okay? We want to, uh, this criterion says that it is achieved if the same rate, rate or same portion of female and male are admitted. For example, in this case, this result is considered to be fair in perspective of demographic parity. While this result is considered unfair in perspective of demographic parity. So I hope this gives you an idea about what it means. Basically, it has needs same positive rate for individuals in different sensitive groups. Okay. And mathematically speaking, uh, if we define sensitive attributes as S, meaning S equal to zero and S equal to one denotes different sensitive attributes. For example, S can denote female or male, and then S equal to zero can uh, characterize individuals that are belongs to female group or male group. And the Y hat is the output of the machine learning algorithm, basically says it's qualified or not. Then it gives you one or zero. Okay, so mathematically speaking, it gives you this criterion and the corresponding metric basically is uh, my, one minus another and it takes absolute value. So you want to see the discrepancy um, between the two groups uh, on the positive rate. And another criterion is the equal opportunity. The equal opportunity on the other hand, side, look at the same true positive rates, okay? So the only difference is this word that I have put in bold face, that is the true positive rate. Basically what it says is that in addition to the true, in addition to y hat, meaning the output is equal to one or zero, I also consider whether the ground truth label of this, uh, this uh, individual is positive or not, okay? So basically says that, uh, basically says that, for example, uh, I want to do a, a carry out a task in, uh, in, in predicting whether this individual in social network make, makes an in income above certain threshold then in this case, there's actually a ground truth that we can also look at is an actual income of this person. So the equal opportunity says that the true positive rates between two sensitive groups should be similar. And it provides the corresponding metric, which is the difference or the gap between the two groups. And these uh, statistical parity and equal opportunity should be the smaller the better. So later we will see these uh, measures and they are generalizable to graph domain. Okay, so now I have uh, give you an overview about the different fairness notions. And then now I want to look at fairness, unfairness or bias in learning over graphs. As we said, that a graph is a special or network is special because of underlying structural information, okay? And the motivation of us to look at a graph data specifically or network data specifically is because graph structure may propagate and even amplify existing bias. How the challenge is that, however, these are non-Euclidean data. Okay? meaning that they are not tabular data, they are different from regular data that are not connectivity patterns. And there are intertwined nature of graph structure and the nodal features, which I will explain a bit later. Okay? 
So the goal is to develop a fair and accurate learning over graphs. So now, let's look at the potential source of bias or unfairness in machine learning over graphs. So the first thing is that the graph structure or network structure itself may have intrinsic bias, which leads to a higher probability for connections between similar users, according to, for example, religion or ethnicity. This is also known as the assortative uh, mixing in networks, next networks, meaning that we tend to make friends who are also similar to us. Okay. And uh, henceforth, if we use such kind of uh, graph structure that I tend to make more friends, for example, with Asian, then this kind of information will be input into the machine and the machine learning algorithm making use of this information will inherit this type of bias that I have because I tend to have more Asian friends, for example. Okay. And in a graph neural network, which is a machine learning model that use graph, what we are trying to do in in each step in the graph neural network is actually trying to aggregate information from neighboring nodes. Okay? And this causes indirect use of sensitive attributes in training. So fairness is uh, comparably underexplored in graph domain. And the most existing works are designed for specific learning tasks or frameworks, and they lack rigorous analysis or understanding. They are quite intuitive ad hoc arguments. Okay, so now, uh, any questions so far? Yes. What are the fundamental assumptions regarding members? Members equal, and it's the same, or do you have different members? Just by virtue of real world means that you have different weights. I see. So, are, are, let me try to understand the question correctly. So, are you asking me, for example, if I belong to the female group, do I consider that the same as all the members in the female group? Ah, Therefore, I see. we should have equal weights and equal connections. Right, and the fundamental assumption bias an assumption that we should impose. Ah, I see. And we should specify it in only those terms discuss the fairness. That's a great question. So first of all, uh, most of the existing works only consider two sensitive attributes based on one, two, sorry, two sensitive groups based on one sensitive attribute. Meaning that if I consider female, male, I do not consider education level or income level or ethnicity. However, that is a very good question because that is one of the important problems nowadays in fairness aware machine learning. Because if we enforce fairness, for example, across genders, then it may actually introduce bias for, uh, for uh, groups, uh, introduce additional bias across ethnicities. But as uh, to the best of my knowledge, currently we are only, uh, currently all the methods only look at uh, one sensitive attributes are ignorant of other sensitive attributes. And this is indeed what we are trying to look at to consider different sensitive attributes and how to kind of um, mitigate and the trade off between different sensitive classification. So the, I would say this is an unsolved question yet, but I, I think that uh, the 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 ways that you are proposing, like given different ways, should be one of the potential solutions. Does that answer your question? Exactly, exactly. You are right. 
maybe what's occurring in this instance, under this rhythm, is actually Absolutely, you are correct. Henceforth, that's what I, uh, what we are saying. This area is, uh, in, is uh, quite underdeveloped. Currently, what we can do is have a predefined sensitive groups, and we only focus on this predefined sensitive groups, but do not look at others, which uh, for, from our experimental results, it indeed leads to the problem that you mentioned, that it leads to unfairness if we look at other categorization. Yes, that's indeed a critical question nowadays in this domain. So we want to look at more uh, kind of autonomous or automotive algorithms to, to identify which are the sensitive attributes that we should think about and how we should actually mitigate them jointly instead of just focus on one of the categorization. Thank you for the question. All right, so now, for now, let's just focus on predefined sensitive groups and two, uh, two, two sensitive groups, binary sensitive groups. And let's look at even this problem uh, is not that easy to understand and solve. And, uh, uh, Let's look at a social network. This is a pocket data set, which is a Facebook-like real social network data. And let's look at the statistics of the, of the real network, okay? And there are a number of nodes and edges and the different features. And specifically, let's look at the, Let's look at the number of intra-group edges and number of intergroup edges. I believe this, uh, this uh, sensitive group is based on gender. Uh, and you can see that the in, uh, you can see that the number of intra-group edges, meaning that within group edges, are considerably more than number of intergroup edges. Okay? So it shows severely unbalanced edges and which is in, indeed shows this in this real social network, okay? So it shows that we have a higher probability for connections between similar users. And uh, an intuitive idea is then, can we design graph augmentation schemes to balance the connectivity? So now we just develop a kind of intuitive algorithm to say that, okay, if the graph has this kind of problem that I tend to make friends who are similar to myself, how about I augment the data or sample the data in other ones or change the data so that the connectivity patterns are balanced. Okay, so this is a very intuitive design. So there are different criteria, of course. AIJ here is the equal to one denotes if node I and the node J are connected. So what the first criterion would be saying that whether or not I am from sens same sensitive group or not, you can see that SI equal to SJ or not, should not influence my probability of being connected, right? Secondly, another criterion could be saying that regardless of what the, uh, what the sensitive attributes are, whether it's two male, two female, or one male, one female, their probability of con being connected should be the same. And there's also other criteria that we can also take into consideration, subgraph structures, such as a triadic closure, meaning that the, the scenario where the three, we form a, in social networks, we call it friends of friends are also friends with each other. And we look at the sen corresponding sensitive attributes and we try to reduce these kind of structure in a network pattern that we use for machine learning algorithm training. So this is basically just, a tr we develop, we try to use some sampling criterion, how to sample the data, okay, to, for machine learning algorithm to train. And we, we, we just tested this intuitive algorithm says we sample the data so that all the connectivity patterns are balanced. 
and let's see how it will influence the machine learning performance. Okay, so the performance metric is accuracy and the fairness metric is the statistical parity and equal opportunity that we talked about before. And here is a result. So these are different machine learning algorithms. In this block, this, these are uh, different fairness aware method. And this is our method that are, we, we sampled the data based on those criterions that we said before. And you can see that he, here, uh, a lower value is better. And actually we can see improved fairness metrics with similar accuracy to do baseline. And the triangle based uh, uh, method actually works the best, which shows that the subgraph sub structure is important, meaning that the fr friends of, fr if we form a triadic closure in the social network based on uh, sensitive attributes, this introduces more bias for machine learning algorithms that are trained on it. All right, so this is just an intuitive uh, design, meaning that we, if we intuitively speaking, connectivity pattern leads to unfairness, then we just sample the data to kind of manipulate the data, select a subset of data to see how it works. Okay. However, as I promised that I will help to understand or demystifying what leads to unfairness. So now we will go to, let's see. Now the question is, can we actually explain the source of bias in machine learning? Because now, firstly, I, I introduced a very intuitive design to say, ah, I think this is a problem, I sample the data, it works, okay? But this is ad hoc and it may work in this data set, but may not work in other data set, right? So in order to really understand it, we need to use some math, okay? So I apologize for the equations that will appear, appear later. Uh, but uh, let's try to see what, uh, how things work. So here is a graph neural network. So have you heard about the neural networks? Okay, so graph neural networks, basically is neural networks with a graph as input. So what makes it different? is this A matrix, okay, uh, let, let me, which denotes the adjacency matrix, which says Aij equal to one if I and J are connected, okay? So this is a graph net neural network design, and I know that you don't know the notation, what these notations are, so I defined it. However, I don't expect you to read it. Please don't read the notation. Okay, and in order to avoid it, you want to read it and make it disappear. <laughs> so now, let I just want to explain this equation. What this equation means is that, okay, this H are hidden representation, or we know as embeddings in neural network. Basically, it's the output in each layer of the neural network. We know that neural networks are stacked layer by layer, and this H L minus one is the output of L one minus one's layer, okay? W is the neural network weights. All these are not important. This says, how can I get the embedding or output in the L's layer based on the output in the L minus one's layer, okay? And what I'm doing here is consider I have an input graph. You, can, you should only focus on this equation. And what I'm doing here, you can see this summation is taking average over H L minus one over the neighbors of node J, this N, sorry, of node I. So this J in N I, N I denotes the neighboring sets of node I. So what I'm doing is just taking average uh, of my neighbors. Okay, I'm just summing up the output of the, my neighbors together and taking an average, okay? So in case uh, you still don't want to look at this mathematical equation, I have this figure here. So now this is an input graph. I have color coded it into blue and green. 
denotes two sensitive attributes. What a graph neural network is trying to do is here is a graph neural network, layer by layer, okay? So what it is trying to do is to say, if I'm looking at the output of node A, in each layer, it is trying to, this is a graph neural, net, a neural network, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take average of the representation that is of my neighbors. In this case, A has three neighbors. A does that. A has three neighbors, B, wait, wait a second, A, B, C, and D, because A has an edge between B, C, and D, okay? So now, let's think about this, okay? If graph neural network is trying to do this, and now what I we, we have already observed so far is that we tend to connect with people who are similar to each other, who are in the sensi same sensitive group. So what it means is, is that in each layer, a blue node will have more inputs from blue nodes. We'll take average from more blue nodes. And since the neural network is layer by layer, so in each layer, I will just have more and more blue neighbors that are taking average over, okay? So that means that if the original data already has bias or unfairness in it, the fact is that the graph neural network is making use this kind of unfair structure by taking average among my neighbors, I will just amplify the bias because I'm taking more information from people who are similar to me, okay? I hope that to make sense. And uh, next comes to more math, but again, okay? So now, this slide is not for you to read the math because it, even I don't remember the notations. Uh, this is just to show that we actually mathematically show that how graph structure will influence the bias. We look at the correlation between the output, the the aggregated representation and the sensitive attributes. And then we try to give, derive a mathematical bound, okay? More math is coming and here it is. <laughs> so, so here, this is a bound and uh, let's look at each term, okay? Uh, again, please do not look at the math, just look at the words. So first of all, there are three terms, delta, gamma one, and the gamma two. Let's look at each term. The delta says, we show that the, this is a shows the discrepancy between the features for different sensitive groups, meaning that how the features are distributed among different sensitive groups. Gamma one shows is related to number of nodes with at least one inter edges, okay? And the gamma two is related to, is related to number of edges of number of inter edges of node M, okay? So even though they are math, let's uh, just look at, this says feature vectors matters, okay? I have more clear in the next slide, just a moment. Which just says, okay, the, the, the result just says, the feature vectors matters, meaning that my profile information matters, which, allows us to design feature masking arguments. Math also tells me that the number of nodes with or without inter edges matters, which means the populations that actually make friends with people who are not from my group matters. So which, which inspires us to develop a node sampling scheme. Math tells me that the number of inter edges of a node, each node matters, it motivates us to develop edge augmentation scheme, okay? So basically what it says is that through mathematical derivation, it has been shown that feature vectors matters, number of node populations matters, and the connectivity mat pattern matters. And based on these mathematical equation, we can de derive rigorous arguments that actually reduce these terms Henceforth, it can provably reduce the bias that are defined in this paper, okay? But in any case, finally, we go to some figures. What it says is that if I have a, a graph that has the significant amount of blue notes and green notes, I should sample it. 
uh, to reduce the gamma one. And if there are much more inter edges than inter edges, I should add, I should either downsample or add more edges to make them more balanced. Okay, how many edges you add or how many nodes you add can be derived by the mass, and you can get an exact number from it. But that's the intuitive idea. Okay, now let's see some performance magic. We look at uh, node classification task. Okay, uh, again on real social networks. And this other result. First of all, uh, to make it uh, easier, the lower right corner is better because it shows uh, better accuracy with a smaller bias. Okay. X, uh, X axis is accuracy, Y axis is the uh, bias. So you want the bias to be smaller, accuracy to be larger. Those stars are our developed algorithm based on this uh, theoretical design. So it always outperforms out, uh, state of art baselines. All right, we also tested on link prediction task, which in other words is like how to predict, uh, how to recommend friends or recommend uh, um, items in uh, Amazon type of framework. And it also shows a similar result. So we will not go through the details of the experiments. And just uh, to uh, briefly uh, summarize, we provide theoretical analysis, explain source of bias, and design fairness aware adaptive graph augmentation schemes, and show experimental results. And we provided an explainable, adaptive, and a fairness aware framework for learning over graphs. Okay, you may think it ended, but it hasn't. And we, I, we still have a little bit more to talk about. So, another thing is what I didn't touch upon is so far you have seen all the augmentation schemes are based on the, on the network structure. But as I said, that there are also uh, nodal features, which correspond to, for example, profile information, our age, our profile images in social network, or our buying history in social networks, right? And actually, our theoretical analysis shows that the bias or unfairness in graph neural networks are relevant to the distributions of feature vectors, okay? And without going to mass, what it says is basically, the fact is that the representation or the output of the neural network have different distributions makes the fact that eventually I will make different decisions. So this is a kind of unfair node embeddings. A fair node embedding or a fair output, node embedding is output of a graph neural network, should somehow look like this. They should have similar uh, distributions, okay? And so idea, another idea would be, can we shift the group-wise distributions in each layer to just reduce the unfairness, okay? So when we have data, how can we shift the distribution is through normalization, right? So we shift it in the sense that we subtract the mean and the normalize it by standard deviation. We just uh, do some mathematical Thing to move the distribution of two data set similar, okay? But uh, for those of you who are familiar with the normalization, you know that uh, this is uh, just uh, taking the sample mean or sample uh, standard deviation and the, and the subtract and the divide, okay? However, in neural network, what they are doing is different because they actually introduce trainable normalization layer to to learn these normalization layers through neural network training, okay? But the idea is similar, is just to learn two normalization layers, so, sorry, to learn two different normalization uh, layers so that the distribution that I showed in the previous page are, br are brought together to be similar to each other so that the machine learning algorithm cannot discriminate them anymore. Henceforth, there will be no bias, as you probably can imagine, if they all look similar, okay? All right, 
So, and this type of framework actually also provides faster convergence, meaning that we know that uh, neural networks are harder to train, and they are all large models, and especially graphs. Think about the Facebook networks. There are a lot of users that if we want to train a uh, machine learning algorithm, it is very slow. And it actually, by doing this normalization, it actually also provides provably faster convergence. And here are some results, and it again on social networks, uh, the lower right corner is the better, and it shows that this type of normalization layer helps us to reduce the bias while maintain accuracy in a similar level. And again, it is similarly, uh, it is uh, consistent with theoretical analysis that it improves the convergence of neural network training, so it can provide faster training as well, to, okay? So, briefly. So, this is a fair normalization layer. We provide theoretical guarantees for faster convergence and uh, uh, show the experimental results, okay? So, what's next? Uh, and not one, one thing that we are working on is the graph attention networks. Uh, some of you probably know the large language model is developed on a work that is called attention is all you need. Okay, what is uh, that refers to attention design in neural networks and I will not go into details into it, but it has been shown that it introduced more bias because we are paying attention to things that we should not pay attention to because we only focus on the performance or utility rather than fairness. And in addition, graphs has been shown uh, widely used in NLP as well, where they have a different node and edge definition. Okay? And it has been shown that the graph can help capture long range relationship with the words, henceforth, this type of graph uh, machine learning are not only useful for social networks, but can potentially also find its usage in NLP. And it also has been shown with the develop of this large language model, ChatGPT, the unfairness in NLP has been a critical problem that we are looking at. And it shows that there are stereotypical correlation with respect to sensitive attributes, for example, um, word embeddings attrib uh, attribute to computer science uh, field to male. And uh, uh, there are also different algorithms also show that they perform better on language uh, written by certain ethnicity and age group. Henceforth, needless to say that they affect critical real world decision making as nowadays everyone is trying to use the chat GPT to do something, right? So in addition, as now we are in a educational environment, we have also seen uh, fairness, uh, unfairness in curriculum, pot uh, potential unfairness in curriculum design for students from different sensitive groups. Specifically, actually, we, we collect the data from UC, real data from UCI, and uh, this shows a correlation between the, the cumulative GPA and the different sensitive attributes, such as income level, first generation, gender, and uh, ethnicity. And, Specifically, we see a statistically significant relationship between first generation and the cumulative GPA. And uh, we currently what we are working on is this can potentially be mitigated via fairness aware curriculum design, meaning, meaning that if we can develop a curriculum design or or course recommendation, course recommendation, uh, course material recommendation algorithm that can mitigate this type of bias, then we can provide different suggestions for different people, in, uh, for people from different groups that might lead to better performance, okay? So given that said, finally, let me conclude. There, we pro in this talk, I talked about the theoretical analysis for the source of bias in different 
graph neural network layers, which is a technique Jian refers to graph machine, one of the widely, mostly widely used the graph machine learning algorithm. Okay. And we've uh, introduced the fair model designs and shows experimental results and talked about potential future works. And uh, given that said, let me again acknowledge my students and the collaborators, and as well as uh, uh, our sponsors that uh, sponsor that uh, support the research in my group. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, any questions? Absolutely. You're right. Facebook, it can be used to Unless it's an advertisement that comes and it says, follow me. But this aspect is an ah. Or is it something that we have to say, you know what? <laughs> I see. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is, how can we cope with different type of graphs, such as LinkedIn, Facebook? They have different mechanisms or different ways that we choose to make links and have different even attributes. Also some don't join it. Exactly. And there's also a temporal aspect. So this question has a multiple different uh, layers. Let's uh, first look at the fact that we have different uh, graphs or different networks that we may all want to take into account. First of all, this is a critical question in uh, machine learning over graphs called multi-layer graphs. Okay, it's a graph or graph or different layers of graphs. Uh, the, I would say that I would say that the bias related issue hasn't has not be yet be explored and even the machine learning algorithm that needs to be developed in this area is still an ongoing research meaning that how can we de, uh, how can we combine heterogeneous graph or network information into a machine learning model to just do learning just to improve the accuracy or utility without even consider bias is still a uh, uh, underexplored problem, but it is a very popular problem because we have we want to make use of a heterogeneous environments, right? And I would say that this type of framework still would work, uh, the analysis still would work if we model the multi-layer graph properly. However, what this framework hasn't been con hasn't considered is the fact that the links, as you mentioned, may be heterogeneous. They have different link types, right? But <laughs> you are absolutely correct. So the, then the fact, so first of all, different link types, you can see that at this point, I only say AIJ equal to zero or AIJ equal to one to denote whether there's an edge or not, okay? In order to incorporate the type of heterogeneity that you're talking about, we need to incorporate more diverse edge attributes instead of binary. 
because there is no limitation to say that I could also incorporate edge features, but what I didn't do in this uh, framework. But this, I believe, could be explored by incorporating different edge attributes. In addition, in dynamical settings, that the fact that users may join and users may leave, and you may decide to be friends with this person, but tomorrow you may want to block this person, okay? These are called dynamic graphs, and as you can see, you're right that in this talk, I only focus on static graphs that without changing, okay? Well, for dynamic graphs, one of the things that we actually touch upon is the link prediction, meaning that to predict whether this edge will be one or zero. But there we still model it as a, uh, you can see that since I did an experiment on it, so it still works. Uh, but I would say that there's definitely open problems in accommodating different type of dynamics because what we are currently look at is very myopic in the sense that we just predict in the next time slot whether there will be an edge or not. But there's not a long-term perspective. Well, long-term fairness in dynamic decision-making, meaning that I make a decision now, it may even influence all the decision in the future, is still an open problem. And actually, we just submitted a work on this uh, to cope with long-term fairness in the sense that what do you, you want to make a decision not only to make the current time slot fair, but also to be fair in the long run, okay? Because there are a lot of things going on, and I would say that I don't think that, uh, I hope that it will not need 20 years, <laughs> and maybe next year, hopefully, if uh, I give a talk again, and I <laughs> can tell you more about it. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Ah, so if I understood do the correctly, uh, what your uh, alluding to is the fact that since we feed so much data that ha may have human or may have bias, eventually we train a model that the model eventually will give us something that is unfair. Or did I? Yes. Sure. Yes. So first of all, uh, not even in the future, even now, that the definition of fairness is not universal. There's, it's really difficult to define what is fair in many applications. And henceforth, what is probably think to be fair even 
now, actually different people even have a different definition about fairness. And that definitely could happen. And in the sense that even for now, as you can see, that we train large language model. And it in, because we use so much data that are trained, and we no longer can explain it well, because it is so large model that there's no way that I can go in and derive some mathematical equation there. And it definitely inherit a huge bias that we may not even be aware because it was hidden so deep in the model uh, with uh, like uh, a huge amount of parameters. We don't even know what it, no one nowadays, the large language model or large models are so large that no one can actually explain what it is doing. Uh, and definitely it is, a, there, there's a lot of a hidden things or reasoning uh, beneath it that we don't know. And the bias and unfairness definitely can be uh, hidden that without we realizing it. Henceforth, I think that that's why we are currently look at a more easier model to try to explain layer by layer to see whether we can get an understanding. But that's definitely a, a important or critical problem nowadays. Yes, you're right. So this uh, this problem is very important, and uh, oh, what it is, we we this is called a face data uh, detection. So that means that in in instead of uh, this motivates us to say that instead of just uh, use the data that we are given, we should first try to pre-processing the data or try to identify whether there are. Uh, diff, uh, problems in the data, such as a fake account, or uh, in email uh, case, it's called a, a phishing detection that we actually uh, work with Microsoft on this. So that means that uh, fairness is one of the goals, but before you can tackle this goal, we should make sure that we have reliable data. Well, when we ha want to have a reliable data, we have needed to resort to different algorithms, such as anomaly uh, detection uh, in the graphs, um, to try to identify this fake account or phishing account. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I am not sure about the government, but I do know that there, it has been shown, actually one of the study in fairness of machine learning that is very important is the campus, which is to show, actually the, we, they use machine learning model to predict whether this person is qualified for bail or not, has a huge bias uh, in terms of ethnicity. Uh, but I don't know whether they have incorporated any fairness criteria there yet, but I know that at least the companies are aware, large companies are aware of that. And I believe that is definitely because the government are, are aware of that and want to foster that, but I don't know any specific arguments uh, on that. So, but I believe that thing, uh, actually, both in academia and the industry, we are very much aware of the potential risks. So nowadays, this fairness and the bias is a very popular topic in the, in the domain. So I, I think that that has something to do with the, the government attention as well. <laughs> 